Welcome back to the Top Notch Documentaries YouTube channel. Some crime cases are considerably more heinous and wicked than others, receiving widespread condemnation from the public. In this episode of the Serial Killer series, I cover the case of Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamolka, two of the most despised people in the whole of Canada. Their crimes shocked the city of Toronto in Ontario, along with the entirety of Canada, leaving many forever traumatised by their actions. I hope you enjoy. Lake Gibson is located in Niagara, Canada. In the summer of 1991, a grisly discovery would be made by a man who was out on the lake. Blocks of concrete scattered the land and some were in the water. One of these such blocks was sitting in the lake, having been split in half. This caught the attention of the man who investigated further. Something was inside the concrete and droplets of blood could be observed. It turned out to be a human foot. Police arrived on scene and investigators worked to identify the crime victim. On conducting an autopsy, it was determined that the victim was a young female aged between 14 and 24 years of age. This was clearly a murder investigation and working to figure out who the victim could be was crucial in determining who the killer may be. The mood was significantly sombre at the crime scene. The victim hadn't yet been identified and police could already tell from the evidence that this was a heinous crime. Just 18 miles away, a young couple was in church celebrating. Smiles all around as Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamolka were getting married. The young couple had met at a veterinarian convention in a Scarborough hotel and had seemingly hit it off. Paul was 23 at the time, with Carla being only 17. He impressed her with his natural charm and good looks, and it wouldn't take long before both were back in Paul's hotel room getting it on for the remainder of the evening. Years later, and they were now getting married, their loved ones cheered and everyone laughed and joked as the couple were now official. At the wedding bar, the announcement of a body being found encased in cement shocked the wedding guests. But, nobody really focused on the tragic news. This was a wedding after all. To all around Paul and Carla, they were inseparable and resembled Ken and Barbie, each with their good looks and outward portrayal of normality. Carla had often described Paul to her veterinarian co-workers as the dream guy. He was wealthy and held high status. She felt as if he had taken her to the next level. Paul often showered Carla with gifts and to all around them it seemed like a match made in heaven. In reality, it was a match made in hell. The autopsy of the young woman found encased in cement came back to reveal a name. The body belonged to 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey, someone whom the police had considered as a runaway from Burlington, just northwest of St. Catharines. The case hadn't progressed since Leslie mysteriously vanished in June of 1991, last seen heading home following a memorial for friends killed in a car crash. By all accounts, she was a well-liked girl, but she was troubled and her parents had had enough of her unruly behaviour. On the night that she vanished, Leslie had disobeyed the curfew set by her parents and was locked out of her family home. She was never heard from again. Paul and Carla had moved out of Carla's parents' house in early 1991 and into a place of their own in Port de Lucie, St. Catharines. Following their June wedding, they had got back from their honeymoon to Hawaii and ended up getting a Rottweiler named Buddy. This was done to appease Carla as Paul hated Buddy and the mess that he caused around the house. Paul was a control freak and demanded that Carla not drive to work. He was arrogant and Carla's depiction of their relationship being like something out of a Disney movie was a complete lie. On their honeymoon, Paul had told Carla that he was the Scarborough rapist, an uncaught sexual predator who began snatching young women off the streets in December of 1987. The attacks had transformed the low crime metro area into a terrifying place for young women. Described as a blonde haired blue eyed man in his 20s, victims who were left traumatised by their experiences said that he was charming on his approach, a nice guy. The rapist would then show a knife and degrade the women, pushing their faces into mud and using sticks to penetrate them. The attacks were horrendous, with the rapist taking hair or pubic hair as a trophy from each victim. Evidently, many victims will never recover from the trauma. In the years following the attacks, $150,000 reward had been offered, and many suspects had been in the frame. It would later turn out that Paul had been considered a suspect in 1990 because of his controlling ways around women and his likeness to a suspect sketch. He had gone down to police headquarters and voluntarily submitted his DNA. 
He told police that he did agree that he looked like the suspect sketch of the rapist, but that he was not their man. He also told them that he was moving down to St Catherine's to live with his partner. Although a suspect, given his unusual actions, Paul wasn't really on the police radar for the crimes. He had no criminal record and presented a law-abiding image. Unfortunately, this was the early 1990s and DNA testing wasn't a prioritised area when it came to solving the crimes it would appear. Only one person was assigned to test the DNA of the suspects and it would take another two years before a match to the Scarborough rapist would surface. In that time, two families would lose their daughters to preventable crimes. As the couple resided at the Homolka household in St Catharines, the Scarborough rapes had stopped. Where was the offender? Had he been imprisoned or was he dead, fled the country? Many speculated on this answer, unaware that the rapist would be involved in his first murder in December of 1990, seven months following his last known attack. Carla's parents really liked Paul, as did her two sisters, Laurie and Tammy. Tammy being the youngest at 15, she looked up to her eldest sister Carla and saw her as a role model. Paul had recently moved from Scarborough down to St Catharines and Carla's parents had let him stay at their house. Paul had plenty of drive and was respected by Carla's family. They trusted him, but in December of 1990, one act would be the starting point for the breakdown of this trust. It was Christmas time and the Homolka family was celebrating their festivities. The Homolka parents had gone to bed and Tammy, Paul and Carla sat around drinking. Tammy was 15 and had been eager to drink some alcohol, so Paul obliged. Tammy would end up deceased on the floor, apparently having died of an accidental death from choking on her own vomit. In reality, Paul had wanted to have sex with Tammy and Carla had essentially given her as a Christmas gift to satisfy Paul. The couple recorded themselves sexually assaulting Tammy with Carla eagerly participating in the abuse of her own sister. Carla had used a rag covered in veterinarian supplies to knock out her sister and this had essentially killed her. Paul and Carla appeared distraught at the funeral of Tammy. Paul was paranoid that the murder would come to light but it didn't. For whatever reason their story about accidental death had been a success and nobody suspected murder. This murder must have had a major impact on the relationship between Paul and the Homolka parents. He had supplied the alcohol and he would have been blamed for causing the death. That was likely the reason that Paul and Carla moved to Port de Lucie the following month. Life went on for Paul and Carla as they both worked and carried on portraying a perfect young couple facade. Paul often videotaped their daily lives, himself always being the main focus of the camera. He was a narcissist and his arrogant side had already been noticed by many close to him and Carla. Carla did share with her co-workers that Paul was an abuser. He'd phone her during the day and she'd have to halt what she was doing and answer immediately. What Carla hadn't informed her co-workers of was their shared twisted secrets. Carla knew that Paul often drove around neighbourhoods looking for licence plates to steal and young women to stalk. This is how he'd spotted Leslie Mahaffey in June 1991. He'd approached her and offered a cigarette she'd accepted and walked over to his car to get one, at which point she'd been kidnapped. On the 16th of April 1992, a 15-year-old named Kristen French had been kidnapped in broad daylight as she walked home from church in St Catharines. She was in her school uniform and witnesses described seeing two abductors at the scene. Kristen's shoe was left in the church parking lot as the police and public conducted widespread searches for the missing 15-year-old. These turned up nothing. Unfortunately, on the 30th of April 1992, Kristen's naked body would be found in a wooded area. Her hair had been cut and connections between her murder and the murder of Leslie Mahaffey were looked into. They shared similar commonalities and residents of St Catharines began to feel uneasy. It had been a very nice place to live. Broad day kidnappings were not the norm. Kristen's body showed signs that she had been held captive by her kidnappers. The community was outraged and in a state of fear. Like Scarborough residents, the residents of St Catharines stayed on alert and made sure that their daughters were never left to walk alone. 1992 ended with no new leads in the investigation into the murder of Kristen French. However, in early February of 1993, a beaten up female would report her husband to the police. Carla Homolka was in a bad state. Her face purple, bruised by her husband Paul Bernardo, she told police that she was sick of the everyday physical and mental abuse from Paul. 
who both beat and kicked her for failure to follow his orders. Carla would inform police of a stunning revelation that would cause unsolved case breakthroughs, the murders of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. According to Carla, Paul was the one responsible for both teenage girls' murders. Paul had recorded the sexual assaults of the girls and had tapes which showed the rapes. Police were stunned, and with no new leads and no arrests in the cases, they acted quickly. Paul was arrested not long after, and Carla began to give details about the crimes. Carla told police that Paul awoke her late at night and told her that he had a girl in the basement. This girl was Leslie Mahaffey. Leslie had been held captive in the home and was subjected to horrific abuse from Paul. Paul would eventually strangle Leslie and then dismembered her with a chainsaw. Police sat speechless as Carla eventually ended up recounting the murder of Kristen French. This time, she accompanied Paul on the kidnapping expedition. Paul wanted the sex slave and was already well versed at kidnapping young women off the street. He spotted Kristen French and upon kidnapping her, they took her back to their house and restrained her in the basement. Carla told police about how she had actually built up rapport with Kristen. They would put on makeup together and became best friends while she was held captive. Police ran with Carla's account as she was their main piece of evidence that would put Paul away forever. Police knew that the tapes depicting the sexual assaults were out there, but until they had them, Carla was the only witness tying Paul to the murders. Carla said that Paul eventually killed Kristen and dumped her body in a wooded area. Carla presented herself as the victim the whole way through her interrogations, even bringing up the fact that Paul was the Scarborough rapist and how her sister's death wasn't accidental. Carla told police that she felt that Paul needed to be locked up forever. Paul was then hit with additional charges for the Scarborough crimes based on Carla's confession, along with the DNA results that had come back around this time. All the while, Carla kept her true role in the crimes a secret. A search of their house was conducted, but no evidence was recovered that tied Paul to the murders. The tapes weren't recovered by police in their 10-week search of the house, and it turned out that Paul had given a map to his defence lawyer, which marked the spot of the tapes. The lawyer uncovered the tapes, and Bernardo's defence team watched them, feeling both disgust and hatred for their own client. The tapes provided a clear look into the depravity of Paul, but also into the mind of Carla. She had actively participated in the assaults of Leslie and Kristen, and even in the assaults of a woman known as Jane Doe. Carla had brought this young girl back to her own house without Paul even being aware or instructing her to do so. Carla drugged the girl on tape, and once Paul arrived home, they both took part in assaulting this young woman. No evidence of murder existed in the tapes, and Bernardo's defence team kept them a secret for a very long time, with the intent of showing them to the jury at his trial. This would have discredited Carla's victimisation story and given evidence to her having been a main participant in the crimes. In May of 1993, Carla had dressed as a schoolgirl and accompanied police around her house. At this point, the furniture was mostly gone and the search hadn't turned up anything. Carla is very detached from the situation and showed no level of care for the victims whatsoever. She asks about furniture being given to her family in the tapes. Behind the scenes and Carla had been given a plea deal. She accepted this plea and received just five years for each murder, which had been lowered to manslaughter charges, and two years for the death of her own sister. Carla would be given 12 years total. At Paul's trial in 1995, the jury watched the tapes, which by this point had been handed over to police. The trial was sensational, and the media had dubbed the couple as the Ken and Barbie killers by this point. Bernardo's defence lawyer had been kicked off the case because he illegally withheld evidence and Carla's plea deal had been kept quiet, resulting in a media publication ban. The tapes depicted Paul and Carla as both being sociopathic individuals. Carla's narrative of a victimised and domestically abused woman was true, but she was just as much of a monster as Paul. The jury wept and felt sickened as the tapes played. The young girls pleading for Paul to stop raping them. He continued, as Carla involved herself in the assaults. The prosecution's star witness was pretty much discredited by the time that the trial ended. Another tape of Carla dressing up and mimicking her dead sister was played, as her and Paul had sex. Along with this tape was the tape of Jane Doe. She never received justice for her abuse, and later on it came out that she was kept out of the case. 
having no input with the prosecution. People involved in the case, especially those who had to listen and view the tapes, suffered from PTSD and marriage breakdowns following the trial. Suicidal thoughts plagued their minds, and the long-term suffering of both victim families and jurors alike continues to this very day. It should come as no surprise that Paul was given life for his crimes and Carla had her plea deal. Carla would be released from prison in 2005 and began a new life in Quebec. She had a family with three children and worked at a school. Parents who had kids at that school weren't even aware of her true identity until 2016 when media flooded the school and Carla was hoarded by them. Both Carla and Paul remain two of the most hated people in Canada and it appears like Carla will never be able to settle down. Her former husband is locked away forever and her actions have been exposed to the world. The failures of the system in this case were evident throughout. Lives could have been saved but unfortunately we can't go back and change anything. Rest in peace to all of the victims and I hope that those involved in the case can find peace and a way to break free from the clutches of this evil couple. This has been the Serial Killer Series episode on the Ken and Barbie Killers. As always, thank you for watching.